church. Good morning. Okay, good. See, yeah, see, that's good, that's good. Each week we, we're, we're getting better at this. I want to uh, point out to you a couple of brief announcements uh, to begin with. One is this insert here with all of these happy, smiling people. This is from uh, Glendale Communitas. Uh, this is a four-week seminar, program, and, and interactive thing uh, that's actually led by our own Brian Schwartz, who I'm sure many of you know. So Brian Schwartz works full-time as a financial advisor, and he has uh, been blessing Glendale with his uh, series called What Is Your Money Mind? And I've talked to him about this, and it, I think it's really an excellent program. I'm planning on being there myself, because unlike most financial advising things that are just facts and tools and resources that just get thrown at you. But his first one, he says, if you're going to come to any of these, the first one is the most important one because it's asking, how do you relate to money? What's your experience with money? Even going back to your childhood, was, was money always available or was money scarce? Was money a stressor? Or what, right? So how do you psychologically, how do you individually relate to money? And understanding that will then help you uh, learn the tools and resources of then how to better uh, manage your resources. So please come out and support Brian, uh, support Glendale Communitas. This is their gift to us uh, because we do so much to support uh, their work in the city. And so they wanted to come here and host one of these seminars just for us. So Thursday, June 22nd is the first one. We'll be up in the fellowship hall if you can come for that. Before that though, one week from today, uh, Saturday night, we are hosting a game night uh, for all of you. And that will involve all sorts of different things, maybe splitting off and doing our own individual things, maybe some big things together, but we thought now is the time for us to come together, get to know each other a little bit more. The young adults often have uh, game nights where we come together and do this, so we thought, well, this would be great. Let's get the whole church together uh, and just have an evening of fun and uh, social interaction. So those are the two things I want to point out to you. Other than that, let's please stand uh, and invite God to join us as we worship. Father God, we thank you for your spirit. Please bless us with your presence today. May our sacrifice of praise and worship be acceptable to you as we surrender our lives over to you. May in all things you be glorified, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to please remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn 28, Praise We the Lord.
Good morning. We welcome you to church today. We have a number of different items in our church life that we'll quickly go through. Uh, first of all, a couple of items that didn't make the bulletin. Those of you in the finance committee will be meeting at 7 p.m. on Tuesday evening. We are sad to announce that one of the original members of the Vallejo Drive Church passed away this week, Harriet Hooper. Went to her rest on Monday. Her husband Wayne was our first minister of music here. And uh, well over 50 years ago, she came across the street when we moved from the sanitarium. There will be uh, only a private ceremony. We extend our condolences to the family. We have uh, six individuals that we'd like to welcome into mem membership today. Uh, you can see the uh, on the Sabbath School page, there are, the names are listed. Lourdes Delgado, Seth Contreras, Kaylin Contreras, Andrew Chang, Dentinia Lambert Kuvanian, and Leonidas Flores. Uh, could we have a motion that we accept these into membership? So, okay, well, there's a lot of them, so I'll make that a second. All those in favor, give a hearty amen. amen. Now, I think most of these folks are over in uh, uh, the other contemporary service. Not with us this morning, uh, but uh, Gentinia, are you with us this morning in the sanctuary? Right over here. Let's welcome her. <laughs> all these folks, thank you so much. All these folks attend our contemporary service and, and are over there. Uh, now you see uh, in the bulletin a big list of grads, and I think we're going to have them up here. Uh, if your name is listed in the bulletin, I'd like to invite you to come up over here by the piano. We have a gift for you from the church and the folks on the platform are going to meet you there. Go on down and, and uh, you can see your name up here. These are the names that have been supplied to us by family. And if any of you happen to be a grad that, that, go ahead, that uh, didn't, uh, didn't, uh, get listed, you're welcome to come, and as long as we have a few lace left, we'll be happy to share those with you. But congratulations to all these uh, uh, scholars who've uh, come to an important point in their life where they're moving on to the next level. Let's, let's give them all a name. up, I'd like to invite one more special person to the mic. Lily, Lily Beth, if we're done, if you come forward. Back in 1984, when I went to the Pasadena Church to be the senior pastor there, there was a little gal, about this tall boy, could she knock the lights out, was singing, even then, when she was just a little bit, she didn't grow up a whole lot, did she? <laughs> But she can still knock the lights out with her voice, I'll tell you that. Well, uh, the last eight years we've had the only best singing with us in our choir here. She's gone on to be the uh, music and choral director at, Glenn, or at uh, San Gabriel Academy. And uh, sadly, you're moving to Virginia. So we want to say God bless you. Thank you for your ministry. She's also going to be the soloist for our second number today, but we want to extend a little floral gift to you. Thank you so much and God bless. Opportunities looks like this. 
Take that insert. <coughs> Volunteering can be an exciting, growing, enjoyable experience. Just, just ask those among you who are already involved in it. And if you haven't tried it, find out how gratifying it is to serve a cause, to practice your beliefs, work with people, solve problems, see the benefits, and make friends in the process of losing yourself in the service of others. So please choose one of these opportunities you would like to take. Fill in the blanks with your information and place it in the offering plate. I will be at the foyer after the service to answer your questions. Let's go dispense God's grace. Let's go declare God's love in tangible ways. Go volunteer. Thank you.
This is the time for the children to come forward for the children's story. And as we normally do, the grown-ups can take this time to greet one another, say hi to somebody new this morning. So children, come on forward. So I'll stay on the left side over here to get a camera. So I'll come up to this side. slide down this way so that you can see what I have for you. Slide this slide down. I slide down. Some over here. And slide down a little more. Why don't, you, why don't you come on down here? There's another step right here. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. I have a story to tell you, and it's all about this picture that I have, which we've had at the end of our hallway for 20-something years, and I haven't really looked at it. It took me about five minutes to dust off. Can you tell me do these people look happy? No. Do they look happy? No. They don't look happy. Why don't you think they look happy, anybody? Because it was in the old days. <laughs> because it was in the old days? Well, anyone else? Do you think you know why they're not happy? I'll tell you why. Because they're Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> I was listening to Pastor Shane's sermon two weeks ago. But not really, I'm joking. These are my, this is my family. And it's my grandpa, my grandma, my dad, my mom, and all the aunties and uncle. And you know what, the school they went to, they encouraged them to be missionaries. Anybody know what a missionary is? Can someone tell me what a missionary is? Anybody? They talk about Jesus. Yes, they teach people about Jesus. What else? What else is a missionary? They go around the world. They go around the world? Maybe. You know what? Let me tell you. My youngest auntie, she went to India. I have a picture of India. Do you know anybody you know what that building is? And here is another picture on the back of something that they wear. And what do you see on that woman's head? A red spot. Do you know what that red spot means? What does that red spot mean? It means that it's from India. It means she's from India, and you know what? She got married. And you know why they do that when they get married? Because after she got married, she said, What did I do? <laughs> no, not really. Well, my uncle and his wife and my other aunt were missionaries to Singapore. And look how beautiful the buildings are in Singapore now. Tall, and this one is a photo and they had fireworks. And look at the funny clothing they have. It looks like they've got blue duct tape on that guy's head. And they were missionaries to Singapore and they were there 
in the hospital and in the offices helping people just like my aunt did in India. My other aunt went to Malaysia, also beautiful buildings, but look at that Ferris wheel. It's taller than the buildings. And do you recognize who that guy is that visited Malaysia? Obama. That's Obama visiting Malaysia, yes. But you know what? Can anyone tell me where this country is? Is that China? It's close. That's Taiwan. And here's what they wear when they get married. They don't wear white dresses. They wear red dresses. And you know what? In Taiwan, they have big earthquakes. And my dad and my mom were missionaries over there. And one year, they had a big mistake. You know what mistake they had? An earthquake. Well, not so much an earthquake. They had me. I was born in Taiwan. <laughs> yes, that was a mistake. And when people ask me where I'm from, I say, I'm made in Taiwan. <laughs> but you know what, boys and girls? I think the school they went to uh, listened and read the Bible where it says in Matthew 28, chapter 28, verses 16 to 21, to go out, to go and tell people about Jesus, to go to different nations and tell people about God's love and that he came to this earth to die for us and that he could forgive all of our sins. And I want you to remember that even though you're little, you don't have to be missionaries to far lands and far nations. You can be a missionary right here at your school, in the park, at home, anywhere you are. You can be a missionary on your own telling people about Jesus. Will you remember that? All right. So I think you have children's church today. So I want you to be happy. And for the first time, I'm going to announce it because I also listened to Pastor Shane's sermon two weeks ago. I want you to be happy and run to children's church. Go now.
morning. Our offering today is uh, the multilingual and chaplaincy ministry as well as the world budget. I know that um, when I hear multilingual, um, you're probably wondering if I speak any other languages. I do. I was raised in Colombia and I know that I can speak Spanish and also, also I learned how to speak Italian and other languages while I was there uh, doing my studies. So, uh, I understand what the multilingual uh, and the chaplaincy ministry mean because I know how our church, the Seven Day Adventist, is spreading around the world. Um, you may not, you've been hearing about these things going on and what's going on in our church. So, I hope this morning you can be able to give some um, generously for this ministry and hope that it uh, will grow bigger than what it is right now. So, um, uh, the deacons are here already? Right? No, I know that they really move so quickly. Okay. <laughs> um, let's pray. We have our head. Lord, you know how much the ministries of your ministry means for us, especially around the world that need to hear your word, that need to get that spiritual nourishment. And I hope that uh, the money that we picked up here we generously give can go for not only for the ministry, but also for the things that are necessary to reach in your word. Thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to be part of this ministry and hope that our church can be able to spread the word throughout the world. Who has this in Jesus' name? Amen.
as we sing our prayer song, I invite those who have burdens, cares, and joys that you would like to bring to the presence of our Lord to please come to the front. Let us sing. Some of you that I really don't 
enjoyed being up front at all, actually. Uh, but, you know, here it is. We're here anyway. Okay, let's go. Uh, good morning again. What was I going to say? I had something. Oh, yes, I wanted to thank the bell choir. That was, I wanted to thank the bell choir again. Uh, we don't get them very often. Yes. Uh, so, I also wanted to start by addressing the reality of our situation here. Uh, last week was uh, very full. Uh, more people were here last week than today, right? Why is that? Uh, no, last, last week was something special, right? Last week uh, we said uh, farewell to Pastor Mike and his ministry. And uh, I just want to address the fact that I know that for many of us uh, that is you know, upsetting, even even painful, and uh, so that's that's okay. That's okay. Um, and I know that some of you uh, are probably planning on going and supporting him uh, wherever he goes next, and and I'm sure he will appreciate that. But I did want to take the time this morning to address this and make it very clear to to each of us. And probably the people that I'm most talking to are the people that even aren't here this morning. But for those of you who are here, I want to make it very clear that while we may be in a time of transition, that does not mean we're in a time of complacency. So as many of you already know, uh, this went out in the newsletter yesterday as well, uh, the conference and the church board has asked uh, pastor Mark uh, to be our interim lead pastor, and so we're grateful. We're very grateful to him for his ministry and his leadership during this time. Yes, thank you. Uh, he's been trying, I guess, for over a year now to retire, and we keep giving him more to do. So we're very grateful for Pastor Mark and his ministry. So yeah, I just want to let you know that we have uh, three pastors on staff here: uh, myself and Mark and Luke. We're in the office most of the week, and we're here to keep moving forward, right? So that's what I want to make clear, is that now more than ever is a time not to become complacent. Now is a time more than ever to come together, to invoke the Holy Spirit in this community, to move forward with zeal and courage and mission. And so that's why today our Gospel reading is the Great Commission from Matthew 28, and this sermon series that we're entitling, Go. Now, you know that for a body to be healthy, that it takes exercise, right? Well, I found out something recently. I thought this was an appropriate analogy, that uh, a couple years ago, Ohio State University did a study that showed that bodily exercise can increase, or I should say accelerate, the healing of wounds by up to 25%. And what a great sort of analogy, right? If that is true of the physical body, how much more true is it of the spiritual body? And that's why I say in this time, in trying times, in times of transition, you can't become complacent, you can't start uh, resting, but now is the time to be active. So we turn to Matthew 28 in this great commission and the words of Jesus to go, Go. But here at the end of Matthew's Gospel, we find the scene of the risen Jesus. And I want to help kind of set the scene, gives context to what Jesus says to the apostles here. The risen Jesus is appearing, to Gal appearing in Galilee to the disciples. And what the disciples encounter there is such a profound and visionary experience that it says, uh, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And that, I think, gives us some insight into maybe what's going on here, because uh, at the end of the service today, you'll go home and someone might ask you, well, how was the sermon, right? And I, I don't know what you'll say after that, but I know one thing you won't say is, I'm not sure if the pastor was really there today. Uh, we may all have just had this big group hallucination, right? Uh, that won't be your response. Why? Because my appearance to you this morning is very ordinary. This fits exactly what you would expect of me if I was simply here. 
But something about the presence of Jesus to the disciples on this mountainside evokes both worship and doubt. So I say that for us in order to visualize the scene. That the disciples are gathered there on the mountainside, and Jesus appears to them not in an ordinary form, but in his glorified body. The luminous, the luminous Christ appears to the disciples like something you would see in a vision or a dream. And here, in this majestic display of his divinity, he gives these words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now Matthew is very careful to conclude his gospel with these words because it kind of bookends the story that he's telling. Jesus concludes, this, Matthew concludes his story about Jesus by saying all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And it's a bookend because if you go back to the beginning, one of the earliest scenes of the gospel, we find the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Now we know the first two temptations, this, the devil comes to him and says, if you are the Son of God, then do this, or if you are the Son of God, then do that. But in the third and final temptation, he drops all pretense, and he says, the Bible says, the devil took him to a very high mountain. So here again, Jesus is on a mountain, a similar sort of iconography of the scene. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him what? All the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, isn't it interesting that the devil can offer the kingdoms of the world to Jesus? And Jesus does not contest the claim, right? The claim is not contested that the kingdoms of the world do, in fact, belong to the devil. By virtue of Adam's sin and the continuing disobedience of the nations, these kingdoms belong to Satan. He can give them to whomever he wishes. But you see, if Jesus takes the shortcut there in Matthew 4, at the beginning of the story, if Jesus takes the shortcut, right? Because that is his goal. The goal of Jesus is to win the earth. The goal of Jesus is to have victory. The goal of Jesus is to receive all authority. But he can't take the shortcut. The point the big picture of Matthew's Gospel is that Jesus intends on winning the earth, but he's going to do it on his own terms. And that's what we see here after the resurrection of Jesus. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has unseated the devil. Jesus now takes his throne as the rightful king of this world. The resurrection, you see, and this is very interesting to me, the resurrection is the perfect example of what we would call revolution in the most straightforward sense. You are familiar with Jesus uh, saying that the first will be last and the last will be first, right? What does that mean? But that everything gets turned upside down. The first will be last, the last will be first, to be turned upside down. That's what the word revolution means, right? To turn over. And that's exactly what we see on display in the death and resurrection of Jesus. On the cross, Jesus takes the lowest place. Jesus takes the weakest place, the poorest place, the most despised place. Jesus takes the last place, and for that very reason, he is given the first place. This is what Paul says to the Corinthians. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. The things that are not to reduce to nothing the things that are. And again, perhaps even more clearly, he says to the Philippians, Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So you see how Paul maps this descent of Jesus, this emptying of Jesus. 
that though he was equal with God, he became man. And not just a man, Paul says, but a slave. And not just a slave, Paul says, but a dead slave. And not just a dead slave, but a crucified slave. Paul is marking point by point the descent of Jesus to the lowest possible place. And then the very next word that Paul says is, therefore. And what does therefore mean? It means because of this. Therefore, because he has descended to the lowest place, Paul says, therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see the structure of what's going on here? The resurrection of Jesus is the victory of the weak over the strong, the victory of the poor over the rich, the victory of the foolish over the wise. And the early apostles embraced this revolutionary spirit of the resurrection by referring to Christ's resurrection in Greek as anastasis. Anastasis. It means literally to get up again. But the term is also a political term that was used in the day to refer to a rebellion or a revolution. So it is literally, this is kind of the play on words that's being used here. It is literally, the resurrection is a rising up, but it is also, what we might say, an uprising. And that pun, that double meaning was not lost on the early Christians who were put to death for refusing to pledge allegiance to any nation or kingdom of this world and pledge their allegiance solely to Jesus Christ. Now, why is all of this important? Because of what Jesus says next. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because of this, go. So it is because of the resurrection of Jesus. It is because of the victory of Jesus over Satan. That righteousness has defeated sin. Life has defeated death. Humanity has been reconciled to God. Sin and death no longer have a rightful claim over a single soul. The work has been completed. Now it is simply a matter of letting people know what has happened, the good news. I think the perfect analogy for this is January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. And in that very moment, Legally speaking, the slaves are freed. But does that mean that at that very moment, all of the slaves are actually freed? No, why not? Because it takes time for the message, for the good news, for the word to disseminate to the people. And so, of course, it's in the interest of some to keep others ignorant of their freedom. And that's the situation that we live in, in the same way the devil is already defeated. But he can keep us under his power so long as we refuse to believe the good news of Christ's victory that has won our freedom. So finally then, the apostles are instructed to go and do one thing. One thing they're told to go and do with two components. Okay? One thing with two components. What is it? What's the one thing Jesus tells them to go do? Make disciples of all nations. And what's that mean to create disciples? But to create imitators, emulators, spiritual apprentices, to create little Christs, Christians, to send out into the world, to create reflections of the one Master and Lord Jesus Christ. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is a reflection and an apprentice of the Master. So how do you do this one thing? How do you go and make disciples? Well, that's where Jesus gives two components. Number one, to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And two, to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Now, I could preach 
a whole message on either one of these two things, but let me summarize this very briefly. Uh, baptizing and teaching them to obey. Why? Why these two things and why this order? Well, again, what's the goal? What's the one thing we've been told to do? To make disciples, right? So how do these two things accomplish that goal? The goal is to make disciples, to make people Christ-like. And baptism has to be the first step in that process because we need the grace of God and the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us to obey. If we're going to be Christ-like, then God has to make the first move. And let's be clear about something. In baptism, it is God acting, not us. Baptism is not our work. Baptism is God's work in us. We've spent the past several weeks talking about the relation of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right? Those of you who have been here, you know we've, we've been talking about this recently. And so I hope by now that it's clear what this Trinitarian formula, this relation of the triune God, might have to do with baptism. As I explain to people when I'm studying with them for baptism, is that baptism is the moment of our adoption into the family of God. And no matter where you may go from here, you will never be unadopted. Right? Now I know that there's a, there's a practice, and I'm going a little off book here, but I know there's a practice, and, and I've shared this with many of you. Uh, several of us, I'm sure, even have been baptized more than once. But whenever I study with someone for baptism, I always make it a point to make this very clear, that baptism is not about how it makes you feel. Baptism is not about you doing something to, to commend yourself to God. But God is doing something in you. God is claiming you at your baptism. And just like the prodigal son, you may go and wander off. And when you come back, you might think, I'm not worthy to be called a child. But the message of Jesus is that you are always a child. And when you come back, you are always welcomed with open arms. So we are baptized into this triune name because it is in baptism that we receive the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. And we thereby become united to the Son, Romans 6.3, and are therefore able to call God our Father, Galatians 4.6. So you see that formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In baptism we receive the Spirit so that we might be united to the Son, so that we might call God our Father. Our baptism is our adoption into the family of God. And then, having been adopted, we are taught to obey. You see, it is only by the power of the indwelling spirit, it is only by the support of the body of Christ that we are able to live our calling in obedience. That's why Paul explains, you are no longer slaves, you are children. And therefore, you no longer obey out of fear, but out of love. So, having been welcomed into the family of God, we are freed to go and live as Christ did. When Jesus says, go and teach them everything I have commanded you, what is he referring to but his commands to love and serve the world? So, having been baptized, having been adopted into the life of God, we are then sent out to be Christ to our neighbor. And that's why Matthew's Gospel concludes with the words of Jesus, Remember, Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How is it that Jesus is with us, but that Jesus is in us? Jesus is among us as us. Does that make sense? We are commissioned to be Christ to the world, and in this way he says, I am with you always in this mission. As Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. So that's my challenge to you today. That's my challenge to you next week. This theme of mission will not be going away anytime soon. And it begins with your response. It begins with your response to this call to go. To go and 
the disciples. Now, Vinny already uh, pointed this out, but if you haven't already done this, you have another opportunity. So this is your bulletin insert, these volunteer opportunities. Now, a few times I have uh, called your attention to something and asked you to write something down. You guys know what I'm talking about. But see, now it's even easier for you because you don't have to tear it off of the bulletin. It's already torn out for you. So you have a form in your hand. Uh, and you can write down your name and your phone number, a way for us to get a hold of you. And if some of these stand out to you as something that you'd like to do, please check that box. And I will be collecting them in the back. So you don't get to shake my hand unless you're handing me one of these. Okay, how about that? Uh, no, but this is, your, this is your opportunity to respond. So that, I, I think we have to be aggressive with this kind of stuff. I'm sorry to go into sales pitch mode, but it, this is what it takes, right? Because it's very easy to say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good idea, that's a good idea. But you have to do this. You have to respond to this. This is what it's going to take for this church to move forward. This is what it's going to take for this church to, to get over the hump. Now, you might look at these and say, oh, I don't know if I can do any of these. Well, that's why you can check the box that says other. So there's no excuse not to fill this out, because there's an other box. If you check the other box, then I'll follow up with you personally, and we'll find something for you to do. Okay, I'll let that. I hope that sounds okay. So please fill this out. Uh, Vinny will also be in the back uh, to answer any questions you may have. Uh, don't think that ignoring it today will then take it off of your uh, radar. I'm going to be doing the same thing next week. But you know what the Bible says, today is the day of salvation. Don't harden your hearts. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that means that the call to love and serve is not a recommendation. Amen? Oh, whoa, that was dead. See, okay, maybe I've made people uncomfortable. But the call to love and serve is not a recommendation. Amen? That was still pretty weak, but okay. It's your life's purpose. This is what Pastor Mike used to always talk about. This is the meaning of life. It's your life's purpose, your highest calling. Not everyone is called to be a preacher and a teacher. Not everyone is called to stand behind a pulpit. But we are all called to proclaim the good news of the resurrection through our love and service. I invite you to pray with me. Father God, bless us with your spirit. Unite us to your Son. Make us witnesses to your gospel through our lives. God, if our hearts may be hard this morning, I pray that you would soften them. If we are lacking courage, I pray that you would empower us. Strengthen this congregation. Heal our wounds. Move us forward in your service, we pray through Christ our Lord. Well, I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, uh, Rescue the Perishing, a nice sort of missional hymn to go out with. Rescue the Perishing, hymn number 367.
want to read with you this morning, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. The Apostle Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. 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 Amen.